Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we are going to talk about uh, the main parts of the cytoskeleton today, and then we'll uh, talk about how, uh, why we use them and what functions they perform and why should we care about them next time when we meet in class. So this chapter, um, the main thing that talks about is the various components of the cytoskeletal structure. We'll talk about intermediate filaments, microtubules, and actins, actin filaments. And then we'll talk about all of them together as it pertains to muscle contraction. Um, so cytoskeleton is what gives our cell its shape, obviously. Uh, and it also allows the cells to uh, be able to communicate with things inside, right? To move molecules from one part of the cell to another and also to the outside, right? So uh, especially internally, this is like our road work uh, inside the cell internally in order for things to be transported from one part to another. So there are three main types of protein filaments that form our cytoskeletal structures. And we'll talk about each one of them um, in detail next. Uh, and those are your intermediate filaments, microtubules and actin filaments. You already knew microtubules a little bit from uh, the last couple of lectures when we talked about their importance in cell cycle, where microtubules are what cause that whole spindle fiber structure to form. Um, and then that's where our kinetic core uh, of the chromosomes is bound to these kinetic core microtubules and then get transferred uh, to their opposing folds. Um, and then you have your actin filaments that are best known for um, just being all around your cell as uh, structural molecules and also allow for flexibility of our cells in the way they move, in the way they transport things from one place to another. And then your intermediate filaments um, that are extremely important, especially in the nuclei where they are part of that laminal structure to keep the nucleus the way it is um, and to keep it all in place. It also provides a lot of strength to the cell so they can take a more kind of distress than uh, they could without them. It keeps them to, it helps them maintain their structure a little bit better. So if you think about these two, these are kind of like the big heavy bundles, right? that are maintaining, providing the general um, kind of uh, structure to the cell. But then this is what's giving it that strength because that's what's interweaving in between that, uh, those larger uh, bands to maintain it, to provide strength to that structure, to the core structure that's there. So the first thing that we will talk about is actually the intermediate filament. Intermediate filaments, you can divide them into certain filaments. Uh, that's something that you would be very familiar with. Am I still cutting out? Not anymore, but you were. Oh, OK. So the first, uh, so we uh, just started talking about intermediate filaments and them being in four major classes. Three of those are cytoplasmic, one is nuclear. Now, the three classes in the cytoplasm are based on their general location and their function. So the first one is keratin filaments. These are part of your epithelial cells. These are, are you know, the most commonly known from there. Then you have vimentin and vimentin related structures and filaments that are part of connective tissues and muscles as, and also glial cells, which are in the brain. And then finally, neurofilaments that are specifically for the nerve cells. And then in the nuclear, uh, nucleus, you have your nuclear lamins that are meant And 
your and that that is maintained in many these of amino acid with very little secondary structure. Um, however, they can combine with each other to call uh, to create these coiled coiled dimers, and that's what you see here are two uh, parts, two of these monomers coming together to create a coiled coil dimer that can then in turn get together with other dimers to create tetramers or uh, octamers or even uh, sometimes more intense structures. The way the tetramer comes uh, together is not completely parallel, but rather it's a little, uh, you know, one that they're anti-parallel to each other. So they're in opposing direction, but also they're not gonna be completely overlapping the whole way. They are a little bit staggered uh, from each other uh, so that they can make it create this kind of interlocking state within them. Uh, and these then tetramers come together to create bigger bundles that can then uh, be put together in a long rope-like sheet. So you have your monomer, they come together as dimers, all the dimers pretty much look the same, but then when they start to get together as tetramers, they are going to be anti-parallel to each other and staggered, so they're not fully overlapping all the way. And that's what creates those bundles that can then be put together in a long chain to create the long threads of intermediate filaments. Now, because of this structure, you can imagine if you were to do the same design with a little rope or some pieces of thread, you are going to end up with a really strong durable thread or a, you know final product, and that's what happens. These intermediate filaments, because of the way they come together, create a very strong durable network all throughout your cells. Um, and that can help the cell take a lot of mechanical stress without rupturing and getting destroyed. These networks are not just in isolation, they are connected to plasma membranes at specific points. Um, so they are you know, kind of anchored to the plasma membranes to different parts to maintain that structure in place. Um, and they can even be used to connect two cells together in these structures called desmosomes, where they're connecting two cells together in those areas. Uh, and so, you know, essentially, if you can think about it, you have this large bundle that is then uh, split off to create other uh, kind of these long networks and within the cell to create that structure and then anchors other cells with each other uh, throughout that network. Um, now, inside the nucleus, the nuclear lamina is similarly, in a way, organized. Um, so nuclear envelope, you have, remember, you have those double membranes, right? So you have one bilayer and then a second bilayer underneath that has the nuclear pores inside it as well. Now, right underneath those two, the double membrane, you have a structure of nuclear lamina that is keeping that nucleus in its correct shape and allowing anchor points for all the chromatin to hang on to this nuclear um, structure to the nucleus and stay where it's supposed to be. If you were to look at an electron micrograph of that internal side of the nucleus, it almost looks like a, you know, a lace structure, right? It's all uh, maintained in a very efficient like structure in a very uh, strict manner, again, providing strength to that nuclear envelope and support so that it doesn't collapse into itself. Now, those uh, proteins are kept in place, the nuclear laminal structure, this whole lace-like structure sheet of nuclear lamina is kept in place by proteins that are anchored into the internal membrane of the nucleus um, that are binding not only to the nuclear lamina, but also binding to other proteins many times in the outer membrane to, that will be involved in cell signaling cascade. So here is an example of how these linker proteins 
Um, and this is an example showing you a particular link of protein called sun domain proteins, how they connect the cytoskeletal filaments that are uh, on the outside with the nuclear envelope, uh, with the nuclear lamina, which is inside. So these linker proteins are connected to other, uh, you know, the sun domain proteins, which are on the nuclear side, are connected to other linker proteins on the cytosolic side, which for, uh, one example of which is the cash domain protein. And these proteins outside are going to be bound to other cytoskeletal structures like actin, like microtubules, like plectin, that are also part of the structural machinery, that are also part of the road network, right? So again, you can think of these as, you know, the internal one is like a ring road or this big I-85, whatever, around the nucleus. And then these are the little offshoots that are coming off of it. And these are, you know, when you take an exit, this is that link that takes the molecules from one place to another. Any questions about that before we go on about the nuclear lamina? I've lost your chat. No, I can't see the chat, so I don't know. Okay. So um, let's look at how these other cytoskeletal proteins are supporting and uh, enhancing this network of intermediate filaments. So one of these proteins is called plectin. Plectin is a protein that is going to aid in these connections, the bundling. You know, remember how you're forming these octomers, um, and then those are in turn lining up side by side or next to each other to create those ropes. Well, plectin is a protein that kind of links those two together to help in that bundling effect, to help combine all these ropes together. Um, and it can also, not only can it uh, you know, combine two intermediate filaments with each other, it can also help the intermediate filaments link to other types of cytoskeletal structures like your microtubules or actin or other protein networks. So here you can see examples of these and these orange proteins. These are your plectin molecules that are helping link the various types of the cytoskeletal structures to each other. The next thing that we're gonna talk about are microtubules. Um, you know, microtubules are the ones that we hear a lot about uh, as far as functionality is concerned because they're important for many type of uh, movement and structural uh, pathways that we see inside our cell. And they are the center point of appropriate mitotic and meiotic cell division. Micro, uh, microtubules usually grow out of these centrosome structures from uh, the central organizing center. Uh, during cell division, if you remember, we had them on opposing poles where they, uh, you know, the centrosome had duplicated and they moved to the opposing poles as they generate these microtubules in order to create an appropriate mitotic spindle. And this um, led to certain microtubules being what we called astral microtubules that were there to maintain the structure of this uh, spindle fiber, the spindles that are forming and other microtubules that were what we termed the kinetochore tubules, which were binding to the actual chromosomes. Now, again, if you remember, they didn't bind all by themselves directly to the kinetochores, but rather, again, with the help of linker proteins. In a non-dividing cells, you see that the microtubules related to this function are going to be only in the appropriate part needed for functionality of that cell at that time. For example, in a ciliated cell, you may see microtubule networks in the cilia of that cell, right? So in this case, you see in the cilium, you have a, a lot of these microtubules, but in the main cell body, you don't see them at all. In a dividing cell, however, you will see a network of them appear as the mitotic spindle is forming um, as well. Also, you know, this one is just a typical cell that is not part of this type of structure. And in this case, um, you have the microtubules all across that cell as it is navigating its space and it's doing the work that it needs to do. 
So you don't have uh, to have microtubules just in one portion. They can be part of a normal machinery as well. Uh, all the green that you see, for example, in this cell is microtubules that are maintaining um, parts of the cell for either movement or for uh, its uh, transport of molecules. So how do microtubules form? Microtubules are formed again through combination of a bunch of different single monomers coming together. In this case, it's not all the same protein monomers. There are actually two monomers that come together to form a tubulin uh, basic structure. You have an alpha and a beta molecule that come together. So these are two monomers, alpha monomer and the beta monomer of tubulin. They combine together, make a single microtubule subunit, right? So if you think about like, you know, in macromolecules, we always have that monomer that came together. This is the basic subunit that is composed, um, that the microtubules are going to be composed of. Now, as the microtubules um, are coming together, they essentially have uh, one side is going to be where more uh, of these subunits are going to be added onto the chain to create that long link or a tube. On the other, uh, you know, and the side where more filaments are added, more of these dimers are added is called the plus end. The other side of that long chain is called the minus end, which is where these are going to be removed from in order to shorten the tube. Now, the microtubules, just like their name suggests, are actually not a, a completely solid structure. So intermediate filaments were solid structures, like they were long ropes, and they did not have a hole inside in any way. In this case, actually, the way they come together, they create a tube-like structure. So they are hollow inside. Um, so you have a bunch of them come together to create a circular uh, structure that is then added onto to create your final microtubule structure. So the tubulin uh, dimers that come together to create that, they start off uh, at some kind of a nucleation site in the center of the centrosome. So if we were to look at the centrosome, you will see many different uh, ring like complexes, these are another type of tubulin, uh, tubulin monomer called the gamma tubulin uh, monomer. That's what this whole structure is made of. These gamma tubulin uh, monomers come together to create these ring complexes. And that's where the microtubule dimers are going to start lining up. So the side, like I said, that is going to be adding more of these dimers together to this chain is going to be your plus end of the microtubule and the side where they're going to be getting removed will be the uh, minus strand. So this is an, a, a, you know, in that centrosome structure, it's not like they're coming from everywhere. They're coming from specific areas on that centrosome matrix, which are made up of this gamma tubulin ring complex. So when we were to look at these inside an actual active cell cycle or any time that they are functioning, what we will notice is that it's not like you always have a structure elongating and, uh, or always shrinking, but rather at any given time, there is a balance going on where monomers are constantly getting added and removed. And so those microtubules that are at that time getting the microtubule, uh, you know, are elongating, are in active process of elongation, will have their plus end on this side, right? Others may be shrinking at that time, maybe getting removed those polymers, and they'll have the negative end towards the outside. Um, and each one of these are kind of independent of each other. They're not listening to what the next neighbor is doing. They're kind of, each one has its own dynamic happening at any given time. So here uh, you see an example where, you know, and uh, as this uh, prophase starts, as the microtubules start to uh, occur, you have that central centrosome, you have majority of them elongating at that time, but there are certain ones that are still shrinking away. Not every single one is elongating at that time. 
the growing microtubules are the ones that are going to create that uh, mitotic spindle. As they reach the edge of the cell membrane, there will be a microtubule capping protein that will be on the internal side of the cell membrane. The microtubules bind to those capping proteins and that binding stabilizes that microtubule so it's no longer shrinking and elongating, um, you know, and going in that kind of cycle. The ones that are not attached continue to remain unstable and they will continue to add and subtract over time. Now, how does this happen? This happened through GTP hydrolysis, less like many of our other reactions that we've seen. So the tubular uh, uh, tubulin dimers, that alpha and beta molecule together, they are bound um, with GTP. So they normally occur as GTP tubulin dimer uh, or interaction. When they come to the positive side of the microtubule, they will bind to that through GTP hydrolysis, where GTP is uh, changed to a GDP, and you get the inter uh, you know the combination of that in there. Um, this end of the microtubule, that is the plus end, the growing end, is easily identified because of these GTP uh, tubulin dimers that are combined together. Right, uh, presence of the GTP in that side of the microtubule is what dictates that that is the positive or the plus end of that dimer, of that microtubule. In a shrinking microtubule, the GDP hydrolysis, you know, the breakdown of this GDP hydrolysis is faster than how the new uh, GDP uh, ones are coming in. So you end up losing this cap. Normally, it's slow enough that you see some of these bound to the plus side, indicating that that's where the microtubule is going to grow. But as it starts to shrink away, it's getting hydrolyzed to GDP um, faster than new molecules come in. So you end up losing that side with the GTP end. You lose the cap, and that causes the remaining uh, molecules inside, the dimers inside, to start to unravel essentially and peel away from the microtubule wall, leading to uh, the loss of that structure and the shrinkage of that microtubule. Now, many of the drugs that we have in the clinics specifically target microtubules many, and anti-cancer drugs that is, specifically target microtubules in order to to mitosis and cell division from happening. So this is, and they can't um, go back to a non, uh, you know, non multiploid state either. Was I getting off again? Yes, but you're back now. Okay. So three drugs that you guys should know about. Uh, it binds and stabilizes microtubules so they can no longer depolymerize, right? So right here, if you think about a normal cell division, it requires the microtubule uh, chromosomes to get uh, back to their own poles and the cell division to occur. While if they can depolymerize, then that can never happen and they're going to be stuck in that matter. Um, so taxi dimers, those alpha beta dimers, and prevent them to ever form the you know the microtubule to begin with. 
So it's going to be even before. So that's going to be a stall in prophase, right? Or even uh, right at that early stage where the cell cannot even get started with a mitotic spindle. So cannot get further into the system at all. So Taxol specifically, you should know a little bit more about since we are also working with it in the lab. Um, so it is a antimitotic that is very commonly used in cancer treatment. It was one of the first uh, chemotherapy drugs uh, that was derived from actual natural product from specific U tree. Um, and it has been used in many, many, many different types of cancers as either first or secondary line of treatment. Um, initially, it was found in 1951 when they were looking at many plant extracts to look for anti-tumor bioactivity in them. And they could see that it was killing cells uh, from a variety of uh, different cancers, including you know, several different uh, gynecological cancers, stomach cancer, lung cancers, prostate cancers, you name it, a bunch of different ones. However, it wasn't until 1980s that they were able to actually identify Taxol as a drug that could be used in clinics. The first time that it was used was in 1980s. Um, it is currently first line of treatment for uh, many gynecological cancers. It's also first line of treatment for non-small cell lung cancer and is used as second line of treatment or in combination with other drugs in many other cancers. The way it works is that it is an antimitotic. It causes a rush smack in the middle of mitosis by not allowing the microtubules to depolymerize. So they cannot uh, finish mitosis and they can't go back to a normal state where they could survive, right? So in a typical cell, in interphase, you can have twice as much DNA, but the cell is still fine in G2. It's still surviving. It's still able to function. However, when you give a drug like Taxol, it can't go back to that stage anymore. It tries to, so that one of three things it will do. Either if the concentration is low enough and there was not too much damage, it will try to divide. Many times that leads to unequal cell division where one cell is way bigger than the other and the DNA is not divided equally. Um, it can also lead to the cell just being stalled in that state and unable to retrieve or, you know, retreat or go forward, in which case you'll end up losing that cell to death in mitosis after some time being stalled at that stage. Another thing would be for this cell to exit without cell division. It is able to retreat in some cases. And if it is able to retreat, it, remember, it still can't go forward, right? It has to figure out something to do in that interface state. Sometimes it will try another cell cycle in an attempt to recover by going back and replicating the DNA again. And now it has, instead of 4N, 8N DNA content. Um, many times that may even lead to production of a multinucleated cell where the nucleus itself divides into smaller parts in an attempt to survive. Other times it leads to an arrest of the cell in this stage. So you didn't kill it, but it can not divide either. So at least the cancer is stable at that point. And finally, eventually it may lead to interface death where the cell is so damaged just being there doing what it does that eventually it dies out from other mechanisms. The problem with taxanes, there are many problems with taxanes. One of them is that many patients develop resistance to taxol because their inherent genome instability causes changes in gene expression. One of those mutations that we've seen is in beta tubulin uh, of the two dimers, right? The alpha tubulin and the beta tubulin. When the beta tubulin mutations happen, it inhibits the binding of taxol to the tubulin. If it doesn't bind, it doesn't work, right? So it won't be able to be effective at that time. Another way that it can do is by mutation in an aurora kinase, which is a survival enzyme. Um, and what it does is that when it's increased expression, it pushes the cell to finish cell cycle, because even though it's not a uh, metaphase plate is not formed correctly. So that is very what you will see is an unequal cell division.
right? And lastly, what you might see is um, overexpression uh, or mutation in the surviving gene, which leads to its overexpression. That is also a survival factor, an anti-apoptotic specifically factor that will uh, inhibit the apoptosis response. So the cell is just stalled and unable to un induce apoptosis. Another thing is that these drugs are very expensive, especially when made from natural sources and must be administered at a really high dose, which in itself is not uh, tolerated by many patients because of the toxicity that they have in other systemic toxicity, right, in other parts of their body. Uh, and that is further complicating that issue. Oh, we're on time. We're at, my, at 12 o'clock, so we'll go a few more minutes before we stop. Um, and we'll finish off by talking about some microtubule functions outside of cell cycle. So obviously the biggest function that we think about when we think about microtubule is its role in proper cell cycle, uh, proper cell division during mitosis, but it actually has many other functions as well. One of its function is in nerve, uh, in our nervous system cells, our nerve cells, where microtubules organize the cell interior um, all the way out to its exon terminal uh, and create that arm where molecules and signals can transfer very easily, efficiently, quickly. And usually this will have both a path to move the signal to the exon terminal as well as a path that moves the signal away from the exon terminal back to the cell. It also helps to um, create, it's one of those that creates those big highway structures where motor proteins can uh, use it to drive your um, path to you know, the general transport of molecules and vesicles from one part of the cell to another through ATP hydrolysis. Uh, so here you can see an example of a microtubule with two motor protein molecules, examples with kinesin or with the uh, dynein that work as dimers together to form these structures that then take these molecules along. Oops, what did I do? I went back to the beginning somehow. Another uh, function is obviously the function that the microtubules play oof, sorry, in movement of the cell as well in positioning of different proteins and the organelles in correct place. So they allow our cells to uh, be functioning appropriately in the right place. They organize the organelles and fix them in certain parts of the cell so they're not just like free moving all the time same thing with protein positioning. Um, this is both important within the cell, but also if you think about outside on uh, the cytoplasmic side of um, receptors and membrane proteins that are going to be part of that signaling cascade. And then finally, it can also help a cell move um, by allowing the stable microtubules to occur uh, in the cilia and flagella that allow the cell to move in space if it is a motile cell like sperm and other uh, moving cells. Now different motor proteins, we're going to talk a little bit about motor proteins um, and we may just talk about this slide as an overview and pick it up next time. Now different, there are many different types of motor proteins. Each one has a different function as to what it is that it's going to transport across these microtubules. Right, So some of them are going to be specifically to take vesicles containing other molecules across the microtubules. Other may be taking adapter proteins along with them to carry the cargo that they have, or they might maybe bind to the cargo directly, right? Some other protein or molecule directly and move it across to the other place. Um, these 
uh, can get attached to the microtubule in any orientation. Um, and usually this involves binding to the microtubule with the help of a globular head that has specific binding sites to bind to the microtubule alpha and beta uh, tubulin dimers within them. Usually this is then uh, added to a, some type of a tail structure. They many times work as dimers, so they uh, are usually coiled, coiled structure together in that tail. And then they end with a binding uh, part where either an adapter protein binds or the cargo binds directly to those structures. Um, here is an example with kinesins. Right, um, and kinesins are again a particular type of motor proteins that can move along the microtubule uh, to carry their uh, cargo from one place to another. Okay, so we are going to stop here, and next time we will start by looking at the arrangement of microtubules, uh, the stable arrangement of micro microtubules that make up the cilium and flagella. Um, which is in this particular nine plus two array to make the structure together. This will include, you know, nine microtubules that are lined up on the sides linked together with linker proteins and that will have dynein molecules added to them uh, as, you know, two dynein molecules for um, in each of these structures. And then you have two uh, single microtubules in the center to stabilize that structure. So we will talk about how exactly the structure is formed and what uh, it, why it's important to have them arranged in this particular way next time, okay? Thank you, Professor, interesting. So have a good day, guys, and I will see you on Tuesday.